Celebrity Theater at Sunset and Vine in Hollywood, it's the Merv Griffin Show. Today, Merv welcomes Dick Cavett, Steve Ralfback, Alexander Koletsky. And now, here's Merv. Hey, we got a hey, hey here. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, hey, where are you from? Fresno. Fresno, huh? <laughs> I'll work over here. Fresno? I thought you were going to say some exotic place like Brooklyn. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, they really come out here this summer, huh? How'd you come out? Uh, we took a, uh, one of those little taxis. <laughs> From Fresno, you yeah. took a taxi yeah. here? It cost us two hundred and ninety-five dollars and eighty-six cents. Well, pal, uh, you must have money. Uh, shake your hand. That's probably the dumbest guy we ever had. Two hundred and ninety dollars, Fresno. No wonder you're down here. It's hot there, huh? Oh man. Oh, I know. Yeah. Prickly heat. Oh. Ben. Yeah. Is that your real name, Ben Gay? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's too hot. It's too hot to stop. When I start to move and the wind whistles through my arms, you don't want me to stop. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, anybody else here? I mean, what is this? The uh, Phil Donahue show here. New yes, ma'am. Holding up a little piece of... What is that paper, madam? I can't read from... I'm... Bridgeport, Connecticut. Oh, how nice. Bridgeport, Connecticut. Where I'm going to be in Hartford tomorrow. Oh, yeah. New Haven. Oh, yeah, that's out of town. Yeah. Well, we're just... Ha yes, sir. Indianapolis, Indiana? Is that your question? I don't know what to say about Indianapolis. You're a Hoosier. Uh, that's right. Uh, are you? That's right. Yeah. Let me hear you talk some more. You want to hear me talk some more? I got a little cold, sir. You got a little what? A little cold. I got a Philly. Uh, Did you say I got a cold? <laughs> the strangest group I've ever worked in front of. White yes, sir. White fly off the, off the air from Largo, Florida. Pardon? From Largo, Florida. You and your wife? Right. Why does your wife have a mustache? <laughs> I don't see too well. Is that your wife? Oh, she's sitting in front of you. Why is that, sir? That's why we got seated. Ah. You couldn't, he couldn't get a seat together? Oh, wouldn't she pretty back there? Now, uh, you're in Hollywood, and you chose to come here and walk around with your legs hanging out like that? Not funny. See, and then you people all leave town, and we get the strange reputation that we're all crazy out here. We walk around at night. Oh, you don't have to stand up, sir. It's all right. Oh, now we're together. Well, isn't that nice of that lady to do that? Oh. It's better when you sit together like that, because later when we pass the hat for the Griffin Foundation, you can give together, you know what I mean? Yes, ma'am. Syracuse, New York. Pardon? Syracuse, New York. Did I what? Did I do what in New York? What did that lady say? Oh, Syracuse, New yeah. York. Oh, right here in front. Me and my wife, we're on our honeymoon, and we love it. We watch you all the time. Well, I just that wanted to be on nice. nice. Well, there is a young man waiting back here who's getting older. One well, of the wittiest fellas I know, though. In high school, he was voted most likely to conjugate a difficult verb. Isn't that a great thing to be voted in high school? But he went on to do a lot of other things, too. Would you welcome Dick Cavett? But it was up. just a friendly group today, and they all wanted to talk. So we just thought we'd talk. I couldn't, I couldn't really. I could just see the lips moving on the monitor. But is there anyone here from Indiana? Oh, yeah. Put the shoes on and get the hell out of here. No. <laughs> <laughs> Come out 
that there from no i didn't do that because i if i'm i'm not from the rude. state no I, but i'm from are you Nebraska, going out so with I a gray-haired could... lady well oh we're not on the air are we are you you son of a gun oh i've always uh, had a thing for the mud fricker type <laughs> where'd you get that huh but you're not from indiana either so you can't do that joke you're from nebraska from nebraska yeah. yeah nebraska indiana much the same anybody here huh? from nebraska well put your shoes on and get the hell oh that's you wait that's my life <laughs> There's not a corn husker in the house? No. Uh-uh. Not about the Well, no, they don't have bus tours. People don't like to leave that state. This you and, you and Carson true. are the only one that ever left. Well, you know Did what? You know that? Yeah, he came from a town where the population has not changed one person by one person in over 40 years. Ask me why. Well, I, well, I have to think about that. Say that again. Set it the up again. The population has not changed in 40 years. It's stayed exactly the same. Why? Because every time a baby is born, somebody leaves town. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> That's further than the state. I couldn't believe it. Go for that. Come on, come on. We better dance quick. I know, we better, yeah. I tuned, I've seen you do strange things in, in my life on television. Every time I tune in, you're doing something odd. Uh -huh. But I saw the strangest thing. I tuned into something on cable, yeah. and you were in India or something. And they said, and here is Dick Cavett, and you were walking on hot coals, you which I don't understand at all. You must be mad. I am not mad. Are you angry? <laughs> Saw it with these two. No, this is true. I, I was in uh, Nippon, Japan. Oh, it was in Japan. In Japan. Yeah, and uh, I, I heard about a, a sect of Buddhist monks, the Yamabushi sect, and it's a sacred mountain called Takao-san, and they have a 700-year-old um, fire walking ceremony. And it was just well, thrilling. And I, how do they know it's 700 years old? See, I don't believe any of that stuff. Who was around to oh. tell them this is 700 years old? They have a very old talking turtle. <laughs> I don't know. 700 years old. So all they have to do is say to you, Dick Cavett, would you like to walk on our hot coals? And you would do that? I have a thing where I... There, actually, there was a guy there from Cable News Network covering this ancient ceremony, which was quite thrilling. It looked like a Kurosawa film, you know, seven several centuries old yeah. and um, at the end of it I had told him that Eddie Murphy I met one night with the Emmys and, and we went out around on the town this town and everything Murphy dared me to do I did as a joke and uh, want to talk about those well one of them we get back to this but one that's how I uh, happened to do this because at the end of it the faithful who are not monks can walk across the coals and I said I told him that Murphy always says go for it so this guy's producer said, go for it, Cavett. So I took off my shoes. I got, like, very nervous. And uh, then the priest said, hey, hey! And it was my turn. There's some salt. You stand in to purify your feet. And then you go across. You move rather quickly in the last few steps. <laughs> um, it was maybe a foolish idea. I we did it here. We did it here on this show one night. Did you really? And they brought down a whole class of firewalkers. Now, here's what I saw. The fire was here, and they, you know, had it st steaming. Yeah. Now, all these people were really nervous. There were young people, older people, all ages. And they were all back here going, aha, so here we go, here we go. They were trying to get their mind Psyching off this them. thing. Finally, what they did, they went, oh, ah, oh, oh. <laughs> See, that is not real fire walking to me. No, I, I did the Fire walking thing. to me is... It's cool, and that's fire strolling. Uh -huh. <laughs> Good one, Dick. But, um, Even the Buddhists have to move fast? They moved rather quickly. Yeah, it, it is not so much that you avoid injury as that they submit themselves to pain to show that they are faithful, you know, and... Uh, I, I wish I had known that beforehand, but uh, <laughs> the last few steps, I wear a size three shoe now. Is Do you? <laughs> Went to China and had them bound, did you? But I don't want to uh, offend any members of that sect who may be watching, so, uh, but I did really do it for serious, and uh, I was kind of amazed. You're I don't a know traveler what it says these days, aren't you? Yeah, well, you know, I've been hot for the Orient since I was eight years old and never been there. You're kidding. Until this past year. Here I am, a man well into my 70s. And I find that you look wonderful. I know, I'm a seven. miracle of plastic surgery. <laughs> and, uh, I think I feel I found him. I, uh, that's right. Yeah. I was slipped under his door years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I got to Bangkok and oh. Japan. Oh and people from there have said, now, when you go on shows and talk about us back in America, don't just talk about the sex which people go to Bangkok and Japan for, because there's so many other things. I didn't so, know about uh, that. Oh, Merv. You didn't. What a naughty boy like you. Did you? 
Well, no, I, they just said, please, there are other cultural things to talk about, not just Pat Pong Street in Bangkok and, and not the uh, soap baths in Japan, because there, there are all these other things. But uh, perhaps when we come back, Which one? we'll decide what it is you want to hear about. We'll be right back after this message. Come on, our arrangement. <laughs> Don't you love the Orient? Now be yeah, serious. Yeah, huh? I do. I um, want to hear about the soap baths. I'd always been annoyed by people who said, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm never going to Europe anymore. The Orient is it. And I'd, oh, come on, don't oversell. Don't listen. But um, I, I felt, um, I don't believe in necessarily in reincarnation, but uh, I had this feeling when I got to Japan that uh, I belonged there somehow. I never wanted to leave. Really? I just it really. But then when I was six, I got a book out of the Grand Island Library, uh, Nebraska, uh, Japan Today, written in 1912 or something. Mm. Your time clocks were good there? Yeah. How do you mean? My I mean, your personal time clocks. Yeah, because from jet lag and so on? Yeah. Well, I use that Argonne Laboratories jet overcoming jet lag thing. It's like a new religion, I found. I flew 21 hours. I don't know what that is. Well, there was a thing in the Times about a couple months ago, and then it's a book done by Argonne Laboratories and a couple of doctors, and they did it for troop movements and diplomats and so on. And it has to do with what you eat three days before, cutting out coffee, putting it back in at a certain time to set the body clock, when and what you do on the plane and don't do, don't drink on the plane, so that's a large part of it. Starving the liver of carbohydrates. And the, this is a commercial, isn't it? Well, you have and to the, do all it's that. A, it's the best $4.95 oh, you ever spent. Oh, no, Michael York just puts uh, brown paper bags in his uh, shoes, and he's never had jet lag. <laughs> he does, and it got very upset because I did what you did. I laughed when yeah, he said that. Don't he... laugh, lady. You may have bags in your shoes someday. <laughs> his wife, Pat, goes and gets the paper bags from the Safeway, and they cut his feet out of them, you know, and he puts them between his bare skin and his sock, and they get on the plane because they travel everywhere, and they've never had jet lag. But I saw York just outside uh, just now. He was trying to fly a kite in his car, so you can Was imagine. He? Oh, well, yeah. yeah, he's got a problem. <laughs> but uh, this thing is a miracle. Well, anyway, you wanted to hear about the soap baths and that sort of stuff, I guess. Well, I didn't want to hear about it. What, what happened? Well, <laughs> <laughs> now, in Bangkok, they have a thing called um, that all American males, because they have a different attitude about sex over there. They know it's an appetite that has to be satisfied. The wives don't get jealous. Do they? We're not on the air, are we? No. Oh, uh, you're kidding. Their so they, wives know they're getting soap baths? Yeah, it's a recreation. It's, um, there's one called Body Body. How big of one? Body Body. B O D Y B O D Y. So and the cab driver That's will. my nickname. <laughs> body Body. The cab drivers will always say, you, you want Body Body? And they take you to these places. And there are 150, maybe, of the most beautiful women you ever saw, beautifully dressed, sitting on sort of bleachers behind glass. Guy with a microphone in front, they presumably can't see, and people say those 124 and number five or whatever. Very curious. I went, of course, you know, as a sociological study. Research, just absolutely. And, uh, You're looking thinner than I've name. ever seen you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> what do you but, mean? They're uh, all like in bleachers and it's. Yeah, they're a... sitting there, just sort of waiting, and they're watching, actually, they're watching television, and they, their job is to sit there and wait to be selected and so on, and then they go up to nice appointed rooms and they bathe you and we've all heard about this and 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 there's a thing where they uh, cover themselves the body body is when they cover themselves with some kind of very erotic soap and then they cover the the you with it I've, I've, i'm told and then they slide up and down <laughs> they slide up and down your body and body body it actually it actually <laughs> totally ruined a blue suit of mine it doesn't <laughs> And then, oh, and then the ladies, sport in the Orient, well, And apparently the ladies always give you a name, you know, so you have a nun or was, some name they make up. But they, uh, but you, often they don't, they just have the number. You feel silly going, oh, 174, oh, and, you know, <laughs> ah, yeah, so they tell you a name. Do they have a name for you? No, I mean, they, they give you a name that you can call them, oh, them. I think. Oh, I yeah, thought. something like that. I, I, I've been, all this is second-hand information, of course. Yeah. <laughs> With third-hand to me now. In and what about Japan? Well, in Japan, in the Shinjuku section, uh, which is all nightclubs and sex clubs and so on, uh, they have a, uh, a thing that for years has been called Tukuru Buro, Japanese for Turkish bath. Tukuru Buro bath. And I had this... Buro. Perfect. And I had this uh, book called... Take me to the Tukuru Buro. Or you'll say, Tukuru Buro wa doko desu ka? Where is the Turkish bath? Let's or, Tukuru Buro onagaishimasu. Madu onagaishimasu means that's where I would like to go. Hi! So, hi! 
Alan King wondered why everybody was saying hi to him. Yeah, you go for the first day, you go around and go, hi, hi. It, and hi means yes. It means yes. They go, hi, hi, hi. You go, hi. I love you. But the, in this, in Read Your Way Around Japan, it was the signs you'd need, like post office and so on. And then under Nightlife, it said uh, Furukuburo, and, and then the Japanese characters for that. So I was wandering around, just looking, looking. It said there are 250 of them within eight blocks. I looked, there wasn't one. In the past year, the Turkish embassy complained that the name Turkish Bath was giving Turkey a bad name. I mean, as we know, the Turks. The, yes. they, people in Turkey or they don't want to be, you know, no, the, and, and Turkish history is spotless, as we know. So uh, they changed to and they, they had all their signs made. They needed a new name. They came up with Soapland, which is, and, and, which is Soparando. 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 Uh -huh. You don't move your mouth too much. Soparando. That's right. The Japanese do not um, articulate a great deal. So there, a lot of sentences are almost monotonal. But in Bangkok, it's a tone language, you know, like mm -hmm. Chinese has eight tones, and the word wong means, and one tone means this, and wong means this, and then, and uh, Thai, the Thai language, is a five-tone language. So if you say ki chong, it can mean uh, grandmother, but if you say ki chong, it means uh, elephant doo-doo, in fact. <laughs> so it's possible to get your grandmother mixed up with well, the elephant uh, doo-doo? <laughs> If you have a cold, I mean. I'm not sure it's also grandmother. It may be omelet or, you know, something. Oh. Or, but you have to be careful when you call room service. Yeah. But, but, uh, <laughs> but um, we're hot, aren't we? You're we are. And I'm yeah, yeah. But uh, I remember that one. And, and you can say something. They'll suddenly laugh if you try to do a, a phrase out of the phrase book because you'll get the tone wrong. Um, they don't have tones, really, in other languages. You teach the tones. The teacher in the... Well, yeah, but you know, you've heard Chinese, they'll say, and if you say, you've ordered um, a, a large cheese in the shape of Deanna Durbin or something. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come that. back with Dick Cavett after these commercial messages. <laughs> Did you see those buildings that just have the number on the top? I thought that was the oddest thing I saw in Tokyo. Yeah, what is that? Well, some man built all these buildings. I guess he was very rich, and they're big high-rises. And one says two, and the other one says four, and five, and six. Yeah. They said he likes to the look number. around. He didn't have names for them. So he likes to look around town and, and see his buildings, which go two, four, five. So he just put a number on all of them. Well, speaking of that. Then did you see the that, nets on top? Yes. What is it, to catch fall because catch of the, the golf quick balls. Oh, oh, that. Oh, yes. Everybody plays golf there, but they have no place to play. Golf is a, Gorfu is in danger of replacing sumo as the national sport. Oh, They're know. fanatical about they golf. They have golf driving and, uh, on roofs. So they hit the ball and it hits a net. Yeah, they have things like as big as Yankee Stadium for yeah. golf ball driving. <laughs> but, you know, there's one fact that no one believes about Japan when you <laughs> tell, tell this. You must be kidding. I'll believe. The streets are not named in Tokyo. Did you notice that? There is no name, and the buildings are not numbered. And I'm telling you that the God's truth, postmen have nervous breakdowns. And if you go to visit somebody for dinner, you ha they give you a map how to get there. You end up having a policeman help, the cab driver helps, people in the neighborhood try to help. The streets are not named. So an address will be a district, and then an area, and then a, a smaller area. And uh, the Japanese, you'd think, uh, you know, of all the things they'd emulate, you'd think they would have quickly taken that from the yeah. West. Their way of thinking is, why would you want it known where you live? And well, it does cut true. down on the visitors. Cuts down on your mail too. One, one, a man I met fa uh, avoided the draft by moving twice during World War II, and it took him that long <laughs> to find him. The streets are not named, and uh, it's, it's just an amazing thing. No, I went to a Japanese public bath because I wouldn't do an article about you it. See, really? all my motives are always pure for these things. And, uh, you must I be kept... exhausted, Dick. You want to I, lie down? Really, and talk? I, I, I was a tall, redheaded man before <laughs> I went to the um, But you're so clean looking. Well, go ahead. Well, and I did, I, I got, I thought, I'm going to be cool about this. And I read the etiquette of a Japanese bath because Japanese bathing, first, you know, American tourists, when they're confronted with a Japanese hotel room, a true traditional one in what they call a ryokan, a country, and they don't know how to do it. They don't know that you're supposed to sit on the small stool, soak yourself entirely first and wash off before you ever get into the, the tub. You never get soaked in the tub. They find it 
outrageous that we sit in the same tub as our dirt and our water. And everything. <laughs> so you bathe completely first, then get in the thing, and the floor drains. Um, I know of a case where a Japanese man came to New York, very, you know, businessman, but never been to America. And the Japanese, when confronted by an American bathroom, are baffled. They don't know how to use that toilet. This is different. What the tub? Th and this man was staying in an apartment in New York. He went into the bathroom, tile floor, saw a round object, to, like that corresponded to the bucket in the Japanese bathroom. It was a wastebasket. Yeah. So he soaked himself, dumped water all over himself outside the tub, of course, as you would in Japan. Wondered why it was going under the door. <laughs> figured this must be American yeah. trait, you know. And the wife was Japanese uh, that he was visiting, and she's outside mopping furiously because it would be impolite to say, you're making a terrible mistake in my Park Avenue apartment. But in Japan, in the, bath, in the mixed bath, I went and I thought, I've got to be cool about this and so on, and there's a, a, a locker, and they give you a small... I had to get two lockers at home and close. And I had a pocket full of change. As I took my pants off, my change walked, went all under everybody's foot, everybody's locker. The American had to crawl around, saying, uh, sumimasen, excuse me, so I'm picking up my change. And then when etiquette is that when you walk into the bath, you carry the postage stamp size towel they give you um, in a, a fashion of, uh, to keep you uh, modest. Did everybody and giggle? I think I have it. Did it, no one laugh, but I have the wording, I think, here of the, the little book for, that they politely printed for American tourists. Yeah, in public bathing of Japanese style is mannerly to hold towel when walking before your private parties. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember Miyoshi Umeki? Sure. She came to America to do uh, Sayonara, which she won. Uh, best Supporting Actress. Oh, yeah, I love that movie. Sweetest. I shot that in Kyoto a lot of Beautiful it. child. Came for her first trip to New York. Went in, I mean, she could speak and read English, but it was the first time in America, and she went into her hotel room, and I said, what'd you do, Mio? She, she said, for two days, I tiptoed around my room. I never made a sound. Yeah. And I said, why? She said, because on the door, it said, do not disturb. <laughs> she didn't know that you put those on the... <laughs> She thought the management mm -hmm. had put Do Not Disturb on the inside. You remember Jack Douglas, the, the oh, mad comedy writer? I remember I talked to him and write, correspond. Sure. Well, it, as some of you are maybe too young to remember, he married a Japanese bride, brought her to America. She had virtually no Reiko. English. Reiko. took her on the par show, <laughs> and uh, she was just, just sat there in the kimono and obi and all, and was just, just sort of to be admired. And Jack Douglas, comedy writer, said to Jack Parr, in your position, a ask Yoko what she's been doing. She's learned a little English. She's only learned one sentence. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I'll be I'll be Reiko. Yeah. And you say. So since you're what have you remember? Yes. Since your visit here in America, what have you been doing? Uh, photographing military installations. Yeah. <laughs> well, the audience screamed for two minutes. And no idea. she never know what she said. <laughs> we'll come back, Dick Cavan. <laughs> Coming up, the story of a Russian movie star who defected. Thank you.